three, two, one. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Failure Fridays where we talk to some of my favorite people about how failure has propelled them forward in their career, their personal life, and just how they've dealt with it. Because I think there's a lot of us, especially as younger folk who are just entering into our career paths, life milestones, and other people's experiences can prove extremely helpful in how we handle that, hopefully how we handle that better than they did. So today we are going to be speaking with Ted Misamore. Am I saying that right, Ted? You got it. I'm really close with his daughter and her husband and their whole family. I've always said Messmore and no one has ever corrected me. Um, but Ted is a Christian, a husband of 32 years, which is older than me, pretty impressive. Um, he has three daughters, three daughters, one of both, of which um, Amber and Natalie I'm pretty close with. And he has grandchildren. He has Boone and Sutton. And then, oh gosh, what's Amber's son's name? Caden. Caden. Yep. Caden, Caden's a rock star. He's the oldest by far. Um, he's also, during the daytime, an information security practitioner. He has some pretty cool stories. I don't know if we're gonna have time to go into some of the more intense ones, but I'm really curious on how you're gonna circle failure into this because every time we've talked, it's always just been triumph and triumph. So, oh yeah, uh, you always paint it good. You always paint it good. Well, why don't why don't you tell us how you ended up in your career field? I was a, I was a nerd in high school, and th that was before that was a, a for real term, and just kind of like computers. Before it was cool. Wound up getting in tinker around playing with it um wound up getting married um to my wife um and she said yeah you got to find a for real job so I went back to school studied computers and kind of the rest is history so you were working with computers before you had an education in computers oh yeah 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 most of the you know a lot of the guys i know a lot of the guys i work with education um it's important and, and it's highly valued but a lot of times they're just people that have a knack and it's an innate ability um, and they just pick stuff up. And you know, sometimes you know, when you're hiring, you're looking at, HR will always send you the people with the glowing resumes with, you know, they've got degrees upon degrees. And a lot of times I'm looking for the guy or, or the pardon, not guy, cause I'm, I'm, I hire everybody, but um, looking for the person that's like really, really done some interesting things and may not have the education that the role kind of is built around, but has the ability, they have the ability to do what I need and probably bring more to the team than somebody with more education and way less experience. But how often today are you, I imagine that it's harder to find that person today than it was 20 years ago. You'd be surprised. Um, there are a lot of folks that are cycling out of the military. Um, there are a lot of people that just kind of picked it up that just weren't, they weren't college kids. They just didn't like school, that kind of thing. And so they went another direction. Maybe they came, went to community college. Um, you see them kind of coming from different streams. Some of the smartest guys I know have no um, technical education at all. When you first started working on computers, what year was that? What decade? Uh, decades. <laughs> my first. Well, I, well, I have to ask because yeah, it's so much more common now. Was about oh, nineteen eighty. How big was it? The Commodore sixty four. Um, your iPhone has about a hundred times more capacity than it did, but at the time, it was just a rock star. It was amazing. And that's how I started. How? And we loaded programs off of cassette tapes and all manner of crazy things that people just look, just go nuts if they knew about today, just the way things had to be done. Everything was slow and you didn't have the internet. And if you needed to figure something out, you couldn't Google it. So you had to figure it out yourself. So there was, it was a lot of fun. But how big was it? It was about twice as thick as your standard desktop keyboard, maybe three times as thick, and that's about it. 
There wasn't a whole lot to it. There wasn't a lot of, there weren't hard drives. There weren't, you know, there weren't sound cards or anything like that. If you made it beep, that was like a home run. Most games were beeping so games. <laughs> I just remember uh, learning about in school, like the first computer was the size of a large living room. Yes, yes. I ha and I have I seen some I know you're not that old. old. Yeah, no, I'm not that old. They sized down some. Um, there were some innovations in the in the late 60s, early 70s that kind of brought on the microcomputer age and made what we know today possible. Kind of opened up um, a world of people thinking about what could we do with this. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how far it's come. Even in, it doesn't seem like a short period of time, but if you look at historically where we've come from, even when you were working on computers, which really wasn't that long ago, where we are today, I mean, it's incredible. Um, it's, it is about what. What was your first job, computer job, first IT computer. job, first out of college? Mm. Your first real big boy job. Real big boy job. Um, I worked for a company that um, was inherently a typewriter sales company, but they had gotten into computers because word processing was becoming a thing. And they needed mm -hmm. a geek to explain that to people, and so I was that geek. Um, decided after a while, I did not like sales at all. Um, just was not my, just at that time, just didn't fit me. Didn't understand enough to be technically competent to sell stuff, that kind of thing. Um, and so after that, my next gig was at a community college in North Carolina. And that's kind of where I jumped in with both feet and did things that I never thought I would do. Um, all manner of interesting things that we were able to do. Just the timing was perfect. And how old were you when that happened? Oh, I was married then, so that was probably 30. Okay, so how long was that after graduating college? A couple of years. Oh, wow. Okay, so you yeah. had a little bit of a later start. Yeah, yeah, and kind of made up Which for is it. okay. Yeah. So the interesting thing was, and at the community college, um, that was North Carolina was pushing the information, the North Carolina Information Highway. That was kind of when the internet was becoming a thing. And you remember hearing the modem noises when things connected up and all that kind of stuff. And everybody had AOL CDs all over the place mm -hmm. that they were using for coasters and, and things like that. So that was my childhood. Yeah. So our community college wanted to have a learning. Uh, teleconference learning center and so they had to do some things they knew nothing about networking i didn't know a whole lot about it then at the time either and so we basically took um two guys myself and one other guy that that was a student we figured out how to network the campus and we basically did it and it was the first completely networked community college in the state of north carolina Wow. And we had fiber optic cables running everywhere. Um, we had what at the time was a technology called FDDI. And it had two rings that kind of went in different directions at 100 megabits per second. And we thought we were just amazing. <laughs> we, we thought we, we were just living large. And we, for testing the network, we were playing a game on the network called Doom, which was a graphic shoot em game. And we played it to opposite ends of the network to demonstrate, hey, look, this does work. And the games do factor into it sometimes. I'm at, I just can't imagine your excitement when you achieved that. It, it, yeah, that, that, was, that was pretty cool. Uh, was We were very fortunate. Um, the county we were in was home to three of the largest fiber optic and network cable manufacturers in the world. Do and you remember the names? When um, that was... Corning, at the time it was C-Core, Comscope, and Alcatel. And AT&T um, had a class I went to on networking and fiber optics. And when they found out where I was from, they um, were very ready to provide everything we needed to network our campus. Because they thought there's no better PR than to provide everything to network the, that campus in the middle of the fiber optic hub of the world and not be any of those providers that were there. And, oh, yeah, so, so they saw an opportunity because yeah. they weren't based out of your area. Yeah, and they were like really about it. And then- um, How nasty. Petty actually, petty. it's brilliant. I mean, what better I mean, it's brilliant, but and like, in how the petty could they possibly be? They chose AT&T. That was, that was pretty cool. Wow. 
So we went and um, Corning and Secor kind of got involved. They heard about it and all of a sudden, everybody wanted to give us stuff. And all three companies partnered to provide everything we needed free to, to network the campus. There was no way the community college could have ever afforded to do it. It was probably somewhere in the range of $500,000 to $750,000 worth of stuff at the time. And it, we laid fiber to ground, through buildings, all over the place, and it's still running today. And that's a while ago. How many people were on your team to help you accomplish something like that? That's a massive, I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be a big school, but still. It's, it's pretty sizable. It took us a while um, to do it. Me, um, and I was very fortunate to have a, a guy that worked with me, and we did it ourselves. There's a, we polished out the Two people? Two people, yeah. You get good at it. When you have to do it on cheap, you'd be surprised how good you can get at things. And there's a funny thing. Let's see if I got something. You would polish fiber and you make a figure eight. This was when this was old school polishing fiber. And you'd make a figure eight, you do this thing, and you do it so many times, and you'd look at it to make sure it was just right. And because you're basically polishing glass. And there are times when I am just sitting there kind of antsy and my hand does that same figure eight. I did it so much, my hand still does it. It's just kind of weird. But yeah, there were several, probably close to five to eight miles of cable that was pulled at the campus. Um, we used some of the campus tech facilities guys to pull long runs of cable for us. They had no clue what they were doing. I said, this is what we need to do. And they were able to get it pulled. And so, yeah, we terminated everything, wired it up and built the network. Knew nothing about it and just figured it out on the fly. You were a student, so that was unpaid labor. No, I wasn't a student. I was paid. I had a, I had a student. Okay. He, then, he, then he came to be full time. And I think there were some days he regretted it. I'm sure. We had a long, did, crazy day. That sounds day. like a, long, a crazy very day. manual project. Yeah. It, so I'm curious, based off of that, where you're going to pull your, per, your first major professional or personal failure from. You know, there there's always failures along along the way. Picking, you, know, you chose the product poorly, you went in the wrong direction. I think um, I had a professional failure, and it was probably mid two thousands. We I would work for an organization, um, and we were migrating. It was early age of the storage area network, the SAN technology, and those things were really finicky. And we were increasing the storage space, moving some things around. Our team had kind of walked through our, our plan and our play to get that done and how we were going to approach it. We kind of said, okay, we're ready to roll. And I was going to come in early the next morning to make a move. I did not know that one of our application teams had made a change in their application and hadn't told anybody. And so I got in early in the morning, thought I was just, I had it in the bag. And we were going to do this, knock it out. We had written everything down. You know, we actually had a written plan. This wasn't a cowboy effort. This was kind of a real deal. And mm -hmm. I pulled the trigger on it and killed it. Graveyard dead. Well, what, what is what is sand exactly? Okay. So I, that's, that's how I know nothing store. about this. Right. So storage area network is like, this is how we share files. And, mm -hmm. and so we would have hundreds of systems connected to these sand storage enclosures that had hundreds and hundreds of disk drives in them. And they're all spinning around, burning power, and that's where everything was stored. And it was it was the latest, greatest, coolest technology. So this was all the data storage for all the financials for this organization, and I killed it. Killed it like you? It, like how did dead. you kill it? Like dead. Like we lost every bit of data. What type of data was on was on there? All the financials that dated back twenty years. Oh my God. For the organization you worked for? For the organization I worked for. How big was this organization? Um, in, in millions of dollars? A couple hundred, a couple three hundred. Wow. Did you get fired, Ted? I did not. I did not. Um, it. When I realized what had happened, I realized, okay, my big mistake was... I didn't take the five minutes it really would have taken. Let me go back and make sure that nobody's changed anything. I made the assumption, and you know what assumptions are. I made the assumption that nobody had changed from our plan, that nothing had been changed or any additional steps had been added, and I just kicked it off. Five minutes to drop back and punt would have saved me eight hours of sheer terror. 
The terror came when we realized that, oh, by the way, the data we need to recover, we're actually not backing that up correctly. And so we don't have a good backup of that. And so now at this point, I'm probably thinking about jumping off the building. And we started- People that know nothing about what we're talking about, no backup. Yeah, there's no recovery on this one. This is this is dead. And then we then we found we found a backup. Wait, 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 pause, pause. Okay. We will return to your scheduled programming shortly, or we are currently experiencing technical difficulties. Okay, take me back thirty seconds. So, All right. so we there you go. we were down hard down. It was eight hours, and we're like, okay, we we can't recover. And one of the en other engineers and I started kicking around ideas of how we could gin up something to make this work. And we found an old backup that was like a month old, and we realized that we might be able to get that recovered. And we were able, after about another four hours, to get back in business with month old data. Over the next two days, we were able to recover bits and pieces to get back to where we had only lost a couple of days work. So that, it wound up being um, not a perfect exit from that situation, but better than it looked. What was your position in the chain of command when this happened? I was the senior um, network engineer. Who was above you and who was below you? So I had some other network engineers, network administrators under me, and I had um, uh, information security or information technology manager that was above us. So then, if you can take us back to the emotions that you felt right when you realized that, which I imagine you realized it how long after it happened? Five minutes, you said? Uh, oh, no, I knew it probably within a minute of it happening because the disks didn't come back right. And this particular technology, right. once you made a change, all your data, it just lost it. You just caught it up. That doesn't happen anymore. The technology got way better, way more resilient. Um, and it's one of those things that, yeah, no, that, I, I won't make that mistake ever again. So what, what can someone, even though it might not be directly applicable to today, what can someone who's going into this industry, maybe going into their first big job like this where they're handling sensitive data, yeah, there might be more backups now or better technology to prevent this from happening, but what could they learn from your mistake that's applicable today? It doesn't cost you anything to verify. There's an old carpenter phrase about measure twice, cut once. And yeah, it applies really to everything. Take a look, if a five minute drop back, review, check, test would have saved me significant internal turmoil, company issue, you know, just, just the challenges that everybody, you know, then what happens is Everybody in organizations coming asking, when's it going to be back up? And when you basically are saying, we have no clue, if ever, that's not a comfortable place to be. No, I can I mean, I, my hands are sweating just thinking about it. Like what, who do you tell first when um, something like that happens? I told, um, vice, our vice president, the information security man, the information technology manager wasn't available. So I, um, Call the vice president and say, I've, I've killed it. We're working on getting it back. And I will let you know as soon as I have an update. And so he had, I had rousted him from a nice sleep. And so he was not keen on that. And he called me back about 10 minutes later and we talked through it. And, you know, we kind of just tabled what are we going to, who who made the error, what happened. We just tabled it. I said, it really doesn't matter right now because I did it. But we got to figure out how to get back from that. And so we worked hard. Um, actually, I figured I'd get fired. I definitely would have thought you would have gotten fired. But I think because, you know, you read Rover say, look, I did it. Didn't mean to, this is our plan, this, you know, and at five minutes, you know, and because we were able to get back in business, there was some mercy and grace in there and, and I certainly appreciate it. It's one of the things I've learned um, that I've carried with me, that just because somebody has a failure doesn't mean that's a kick up to the curb. No, but even in your example, I think that how you handle failure is even more valuable in many, most situations than the failure itself, right? You were accountable immediately. You were apologetic, but then you also provided a solution. So I think 
combining those in, in any type of failure, provide a solution. If you are in any type of situation where you are presenting a problem, always try to provide a solution just in general. And then just being purely accountable, especially today, man, I just feel like the more people I meet and typically the younger they are, accountability just seems to be something that is fleeting today. I don't, would you agree with that? It just seems like there's always a reason why something's happened and saying, look, I screwed up bad. This is where we can go from here. I take full responsibility. I accept any consequences that you throw at me. I, what, it should be common sense that that should be your first reaction when you really mess up. You know, and everybody's always worried about, I guess the CYA covering themselves. And yeah, and there's times I think you need, you know, to make sure that you've done your due diligence and you've got, if, if you weren't in the wrong, you didn't really, you're just the person that caught it. It fell in your lap. Um, you may want to have that in place, but I think it, it comes back to, I tell my team um, now, when you come to me with a problem, I'm, I'm expecting you to say, okay, we've tried these five things. We've looked in these areas and we, we've, we have a situation that um, we don't know how to proceed from here and they're looking for some direction. For some direction. And, what, and, and I love it because then I see what they've done and how they're thinking about the problem. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I look at it and say, have you thought about a completely different direction, which they may not have even have occurred to them, or something really crazy that I didn't know we could do that. And so I'll try to kind of guide them in that direction. It what makes me mad is when they bring me a, hey, we got a problem, and I see no effort on their part to at least get me enough details to know what the problem is. So I kick it back to them every time. So you're saying that you appreciate when people try to figure out a solution. They apply, execute solutions to the problem before they come to you in, in a manner of hierarchy, right? Assuming you're at the top of the hierarchy, you want people below you to present, when they're presenting a problem to show you the things they've tried to fix that problem on their own before they come to you. Or at least show me, I've looked at it and these are the things that we see. Sometimes it's like, well, just, they're afraid to pull a trigger on something. They found they found a solution, potential solution. They're not certain what they need to do. Um, and really, what we're after is I want to empower them to take to take the initiative to find a potential solution, try what they can, and then if it and tell me what's happening with that. Um, I really don't want to kick anybody for for if they really take initiative and they're doing the right thing. I don't want to kick somebody for that. Um, we may have, we may after the fact sit down and say, "Hey, look, you kind of were a little crazy there. Let's let's talk about it." One of the things I've learned is um, when when you how when your hair is on fire. It's one of those instances your hair is on fire, and everybody's running around, and the CEO is coming asking what in the world's going on. It's vital to get really, really calm. Because what scares both your team and leadership is when you are having just utter chaos and you're spouting chaos. So what you got to do is rein it in and say, okay, this is where we're at and walk through it slowly. Um, and I, I'm pretty lucky. I tend to do that. Um, I tend to be able to kind of focus on that. I've worked with some guys that are really good at it. And I worked with some other people that really needed to work on that skill. Um, they kind of get amped up and I'm like, no, 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 less caffeine, no more Red Bull, we're <laughs> working on, on a problem. And you kind of want to constrain their actions a little bit to keep them from going off and saying something um, crazy. So playing, playing devil's advocate here, do you think being incredibly calm and collected during time of utter chaos most likely, I mean, in this fictitious situation, chaos that is because of your actions that could come off as cocky or inconsiderate or it, it could, aloof. If, it, and it can. Um, but I think what you, what I'm trying to do is, okay, I'm, I'm seeing all the energy from everybody spun up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to help both the people handling the incident look at it and, and calmly assess it. They don't want to be able to speak back to leadership who are always worried about PR, revenue, you know, those kind of things. Um, mm -hmm. And so we want to try to 
give them confidence. If they see me leading the incident and I look like I'm rattled, they're, that causes them to lose confidence and I get worried really quick. Especially because you would assume, presumably, have a more understanding in that area than leadership, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of typical. Um, you know, it, most companies have a cybersecurity incident. You know, you've got a cyber team that's working on that, but you've probably got PR, HR, media, legal, everybody's involved at a different level engaging in that. And so my goal is feeding, feeding up information about where we're at, how we're dealing with an issue or would deal with an issue and making sure that my team sees that I think we've got this. I so learned, let's, go, I heard, let's uh, go over that. Okay. That's, that's so what you appreciate as a leader, but then also someone who has royally screwed up in a leadership position and then dealt with leadership above your leadership. First and foremost, try to fix the problem. Secondly, accountability. Thirdly, it is calmness, especially amongst leadership who might not be as well versed in that area. And am I missing one? I feel like there was four. Calmness, accountability. Solutions, providing additional solutions to leadership for you to try to fix whatever problems presented to you. I mean, the, the calmness in general, I feel like that's something that has to be practiced. You're either born with it or you really have to practice it. That doesn't seem like a natural skill set for many people. Some people are better at it than others. It's, and it's and you still have to continue to learn. And you find you'll get into a situation or an incident that's way outside your wheelhouse. It's hard to maintain that calm then. And and that calm would and you mentioned being aloof earlier. And it's not really that, it's being being able, I, I think, maybe to speak in a way that helps people feel comfort. Okay. Where they're not concerned about they think you've got a handle on it. You may not have a handle on it at all. Your hair may be on fire, the house is on fire, and the fire department is on strike. But you've got to let them know that you're going to do everything you can to take care of the situation. So I would say it's definitely a characteristic of a natural leader. I think that's a really good way to, if you're looking to hire people, so, I mean, we spend a lot of time talking to people that are coming into an industry for the first time and learning from the mistakes you make, but maybe as a hiring manager or someone who's looking to hire a leadership role, that's a good way to spot someone to kind of bring under your wing and train, no? I mean, especially right now, I'm constantly looking for ways to provide my employees upward mobility and also create new positions for new employees because that's part of scaling a business. But it's really hard, especially today. And if you own a business, whether it's small or big, you know it's hard to hire people right now. So I think that's incredibly valuable. Look for people that don't freak out when they should freak out if you're looking for a leadership role. Now, that's not to say that you don't go up on the roof of the building and scream when nobody's around. Right. And you know, vent, vent a little bit, but it's it's... Sometimes it's just recognizing this thing is bigger than me and this is going to be a deal we've got to deal with. And how do we wrestle it down? How do we fix it? How do we deal with those issues? That's, that's the hard part. And being able to communicate both upward and, and, and to your team, I think, is, is vital. One of the movies that um, I have always really liked, and it's, it's a dark movie, but it's, it's really good. It's called We Were Soldiers. And Colonel Hal Moore is is featured in it. And there's a phrase in there, a line he says, there is always one more thing you can do. And that's just stuck with me. Yes. Um, so when I hit something that's crazy, I'm like, there's always one more thing. What is it? Sometimes you gotta work hard to find it and it's not easy, but you're looking for that. What is that one thing we can do to kind of fix this? So let's say you did get fired. And let's pretend we're talking to someone who screwed up royally like you did, and they did uh, lose their job. What is the next step to recover from a failure like that? Because it's not like you can use that on your resume. 
you know, I work in a, in, a, in information security. It's kind of a smaller community. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and usually if something goes bad in that community, people get, you know, now people get whacked and, and they're gone because everybody's looking for, you know, somebody to be responsible. And, and so sometimes it's if people know what happened or if, you know, why did you leave? They ask you, why did you leave your prior company? And you say, you know, um, we parted ways because, and just be honest and say, look, this is what happened. I'm an idiot. And I, this is what I did. And I rushed to get it done because I was wanted to get it done on time and save time, all those kind of things. And so, you know, I have learned a painful, hard lesson. And in some cases, people will say, you know, that's okay. You probably won't ever make that mistake again. No. I think that's a good point. It's so you would recommend maybe even putting it on your resume. Well, you know, I don't know that I'd put it on there because the way automated HR systems work, one never knows what gets through. Um, mm-hmm. But in the interview, it, it, it comes up. Why did you leave your prior company? You know, what's what's different? Why do you think here? And you just tell them this is this is what happened. I just royally messed up. And you know, when you fess up on yourself. It's a lot hard for people to call you out about it. But if they call your previous employer and, you know, HRs don't really say they're eligible for hire, not, not eligible for, for hire, that kind of thing. Um, but if they happen to know somebody at the company and they go have a beer with them, it would be the first time it's happened. Hey, what do you know about Ted? And well, we had this issue. Mm-hmm. And, but I've already told them about the issue. So it's not like I've hidden anything from them. So when what I'm saying matches up with what the person said, they say, then that's a win because they're like, okay, I was shooting straight with them and clearly had learned a lesson. So just assume that everybody knows everything, especially in a small community like information security. Right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a lot of people, but it's everybody talks a lot. What's the demand for a position like that right now? It's high. I mean, it's security is always going to be there. Ransomware attacks are everywhere. Um, nation state attacks are everywhere. It's just, it's a constant evolving process. Used to be in security, you could do everything. And you could wear multiple hats. Not anymore. You find what you're good at and kind of live in that space. Um, you know, when I'm hiring, I know the role I want. I know the kind of person I want for it. I have a, an, had an analyst role come open and I hired a young man that is a rabid pit bull <laughs> in tracking down incidents. He is amazing. And there are times I have to say, okay, you've run that one as far as we can go. That's just noise, just pull him back because he has to know the final outcome. And it's just finding that's great. but. In that community, yeah, it's we talk a lot. So when you say that he's a pit bull at running down incidents, he's finding problems in the software of your own company. He'll he'll find something. We'll see we'll see somebody get um, maybe a piece of malware on their computer. We're trying to figure mm-hmm. out where it came from, what it did, how they got it. Users typically won't tell you, "Hey, I was out here monkeying around on the internet and I clicked this link." Mm-hmm. They don't ever tell. They don't want to tell you that. Um, or I got this email and I opened it up and it did this thing and well, we found out, we knew it, we alerted inside, did the thing, but you didn't alert us to tell us, now tell me what you were doing. And he's good at ferreting out that information and figuring out where it came from, potential impacts, and how do we need to respond. How do you explain something? Because I, I have a, another client who has a similar job and he says it's really hard presenting issues to leadership that don't understand your job. How do you break down something as complicated? Because I feel like it's two different worlds, right? If you're in it, what you're talking about is incredibly elementary, but when you're talking to people outside of it, it's really hard to break down. It's like when I'm talking you know, to someone who has no idea about finance at all. Yours is even more complex, even less people know about what you do. What's that like dealing with leadership that control essentially the outcome of your job? You're, your job in general, that don't understand what you do. It's, it, it, it is, I think some days it's harder than others, especially on some topics. Um, 
something's in the news. Ransomware now is the big thing in the news. And so everybody wants to know about it. And so you're trying to explain it to um, people. And so you got to find something that they point of reference. Maybe it's an analogy you can pull from golf or from, from something else and, and kind of help them get it, get their head around it. I tend not to give super technical talks um, to my core leadership simply because they take a long time and they really don't have the time to sit there and hear me rant and rave about um, security keys or you know how we should do something. Um, certificate sizes, things like that. They don't really care. They want me to do that and handle that. They they trust me to do that. But then when I talk to them, I kind of give them a generality. Okay, the, what we're moving to is 10 times better than what we had. And it will allow us to do this safely. And that's kind of the way I couch that. And you just, you know, I have a Southern accent, so I can use Southern idioms um, with the best of them. Some things like that dog will hunt. Um, and you just got to find your people and find what they like and find a way to get them to understand and kind of track with what you're saying. They may not understand the technology, but they can understand if we get burned with ransomware, this is going to be bad and it's going to be expensive. Exactly. And I think bringing it back to failure, that's super important is if you're going to be accountable and you're going to provide a solution to a problem, who you're telling, which is in a corporate setting, going to be leadership. A lot of times people who do not do what you do, you have, you have got to, you have to be able to speak your language, but then you have to be able to translate it. Especially when it's a big failure or a big problem that could, you know, cause like, like you deleting years, decades of financial data. You have to be able to describe that in a way that they understand it. Because what I've learned in my career is people fear so much more what they don't understand. So presenting a problem in a digestible manner, I think is the first step or maybe one A step of dealing with a problem or failure at your own cost. Making, making it just make sense in the most fundamental way. You know, sometimes it means, okay, we need to schedule a lunch and let's go talk and sit down with with that particular leader in, in that in that business element and say okay this is kind of where we're going with that and this is the why mm -hmm. um you know just because we want to i want them to understand and some you know some some leaders have a desire to know more and others like my plate's already full that's why i hire you guys to, to take care of that and provide me good intelligence and direction but you know sometimes leaders say okay tell me why you we do a lot of um and I've done a lot of vendor re reviews. So a company says, we want to use a piece of software for whatever. And so we want to look, what does it do? Where is it based? Who's going to have access to the data? All those kind of things. The business doesn't really care. They just said, this is really cool and it'll make it, everybody be happy. It'll be, just be wonderful. And I'm like, but if it leaks your data, and let's say you're in healthcare and you, you're going to leak HIPAA data, mm, HIPAA, from yeah. PHI, that's a big deal. Or financial data, you know, there it becomes very touchy. So what you're trying to do is say, I don't want to be the no guy in the information security and say, no, you can't do it. There are some days I do get to say that and it doesn't necessarily feel good, but I, I say it with passion. Oh, you no, love you know, it. And yell and scream. But I want to be the, the, I see what you need to do. I, know, I hear what you want to accomplish. What do I need to do? What are the pieces of this that you absolutely have to have? And kind of, instead of getting 100%, what if I can get you 80% of where you want to go securely and with resiliency and provide you the feature sets you want there? And let's work on this other 20%. And a lot of times you get the business to say, okay, that's those would be nice, but we don't have to have them. We can go with this. And, and you're able to kind of steer them in a direction that will be more secure. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm on a worry. I'm a professional worrier. I worry about all the applications, all the operating systems, all the stuff we have. So the less I have to worry about, the happier I am. The beauty of compromise. It's also the secret to a happy marriage, guys. Well, it, it's, it, oh yeah. <laughs> it is. So amongst all of your professional failures, I mean, not even just this big one, how has it shaped you 
as a leader, as an employee, now, maybe even as a father, as a, in your per personal life, how do you deal with failure now because of the failure that you've experienced in the past? Part of it, you know that you can recover from it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes early on, you're like, huge, oh, huge. I've, had this, I've had this thing and it's just catastrophic. No, it's not. You will recover. You can recover. Um, don't let it define you. Your failures don't define you. Um, in a lot of ways, you learn more from your failures. I learned not to do, there's some things I don't do. There's some... Hence the podcast. Hence the podcast. Yes, yeah, I don't, there's some things you just don't do. There's some technologies, we don't buy that. We just don't do it, why, it's just a problem. And you know, somebody says, why? I, had, I just, we don't do that, that's gonna be a bad idea. And, and you learn that and you start applying it to other things. Um, there are days probably that you know, I, I don't get it together and it's just, I like stuff, you know, you can only take on so much, both personally and professionally, things going on, challenges with COVID and all the things that have, that have come from that. This has been a pretty stressful um, couple of years. Especially and in I your industry. It, yeah, well, and, and you, and people work at home and hybrid, it's just, it's a challenge. Um, and, and I think you wind up, um, Sometimes you carry more than you need to, and it will come out. Sometimes you can't carry everything, and it kind of reminds me if you ever pick up Jello as a kid and you mash it in your hands. Jello comes out in a weird place; it squirts out of you know between your fingers and stuff. And I think that's a lot of time with stress and things that we don't deal well with what's going on because we're trying to carry too much. So you got to figure out how to put some of that stuff down, whether it's um, going out and, and, and exercising or I fish. So for me, that's therapy. So I can go fish and I, I don't think about work. It's just, that's nice. So there, there you gotta find ways to lessen that burden so that you are focusing on the problems so that you don't miss something, that you're not so entwined in everything going on that you miss a, you know, a clue or something that's right there in front of you. That's one thing that I could do better at. Um, what, not even just with stress in general, which could be a form of failure if you think about it when you get super stressed, because stress will bleed in. It's like a leak in your roof. It's gonna find a way to come out some way or form in your life. I need to do a better job of finding that outlet, like yours is fishing. I don't have an outlet that is totally separated from work. My work bleeds into every aspect of, but that's because I love what I do and it's, very deeply meshed and intertwined into my personal life, but I still think I need to find that thing where work is just not allowed. And I would challenge other people listening if you don't have that to also find that thing. I haven't found it yet, but I think it's important to have it. So you want to hear the story about the personal failure when you get too much on you? Yeah, I mean, some people like that though. Yeah, so, no, 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 there's a point. So, you know, um, my dad lives with us, and he mm -hmm. has Alzheimer's, and mm -hmm. that that brings some adventure. Some days are okay, and some days are full contact circus. And uh, about a month or so ago, Dad and I, we go to breakfast on Saturday morning. That's kind of our thing. He likes to go out, we go out and eat. And we went to a restaurant, and we had breakfast. We're having a really good day. I mean, I thought this is stays working out pretty good for us. And I'm kind of excited. And he said, well, I've got to go to the bathroom. All right, no big deal. We've done this before. So he, he walks with a cane and his best speed is about a hundred yards an hour. <laughs> and so he's not going to outrun anything. It's but we, not funny, I'm sorry. Back. Yeah, it's just, it is, it is. And it's old, he has bad knees and challenges. And, but we get there and luckily the restaurant, the, the, handicap style was really big and it was really clean because that's always a crapshoot at the public restaurant mm -hmm. and um we got in there and dad began to get ready to do something i said well, let me get the door shut i'm trying to help him and get his cane and all that and we proceeded to have a nightmare biohazard kind of incident oh no it, yeah, there it just went. It went hor. It went horrible. What you do? Dad was moving around and not helping and making it worse. And 
you know, it was one of those days, it had been a really hectic week at work, a lot of stuff going, just a lot of stuff. And I had, mm -hmm. and I, I was wound up super tight and I just completely melted down. It lost it. I mean, I said, I said things, you know, to my dad, I cannot believe I mouthed those words. How did he take it? How did that affect him? Uh, he was confused and bewildered, but most, a lot of times his attention, you know, his memory, short-term memory is only five minutes. So. Well, lucky you in that case scenario. He finally asked me, he said, why are you crying? Well, I'm sitting in the floor in the biohazard, um, just weeping because I, I recognize I've taken out my stress and frustration on somebody who's purely defenseless. Yeah. And I know better than that. I mean, I'm a believer. And I, I did such verbal abuse to the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, that I, I was just desperately ashamed that I could be, actually be that wicked. I've and been I, there. Then I, then I was frustrated because I can't even apologize to him because he doesn't remember that it happened. Oh, the pain and knowing what you did and just having to live with that and not having a chance to reconcile. Oh, no, I no. never thought about that. And yeah, I, that was not a good day for me. But there's a, a lot of time, you know, music kind of plays a role in our lives in so many ways. And Leonard oh. Cohen has a song called Hallelujah. And there's a, really, from a biblical standpoint, it's horrid. They just, just take gross liberties with scripture. But there's a, there's a section there where he talks about a broken hallelujah. And I thought, well, that's where I'm at. I, I, I want my faith to be strong but today, best I got the broken hallelujah. I just, I'm done. And I just had a really, really tough weekend. And then dad looks at me like, well, what's the matter? Let's go get some ice cream. And he's completely f forgot about it. Now, when we left the restaurant, we were clean. He was clean. The bathroom was cleaner than we got there. And so- How, how did you do that? You, I've learned to be very creative with hand soap, paper towels, disposable wipes and all manner of things. So you just, yeah, I did. Wow. But, and, and I thought about it, the more I thought about it, I got dad cleaned up, is that, that was a learning lesson for me. That yeah, there's a point that I cannot pass because what comes out is not good. So and that's, that's, that's an, an that's the first time in your life that's ever happened. That's Where the first time just... I completely melted down and just like, you know. Wow. Been, been just so frustrated with a single individual. I just, you know, and it makes you mad because I know he's not responsible for his actions. No, but I mean, understand. I'm just impressed that was the first time. It's, you know, are there days that he aggravates you? Yeah, but this was the first time I just completely, completely lost it, melted down and just was broken. I mean, that's. I think the next week was just a, a really long, dark week because I just was was so frustrated at me. And, you know, looking back, uh, you know, going to church, I was able to kind of rethink through that and, and, and recognize, hey, I know what my faith says. I am, I am, I am loved mm -hmm. by my Savior. War wrinkles. And, and wickedness included. And so there is, there's there's some freedom there from that. And, you know, we had trick or treat last night and so Pop's handing out, giving out candy, having a big time. And we're sitting there, I'm thinking, he has no clue that I've been, how frustrated with it. And he just doesn't remember it. And I'm kind of glad that he didn't remember what I said. Um, so it made me, makes me know, feel good that you know, maybe I didn't hurt him as deeply as I was afraid I had. No, but I think that that incident had a role, had a meaning, right? Like that needed to happen. Anyone who, I have not had to take care of a parent or much less lived with a parent that needed caring for, but I have several clients who are currently at that stage in their life and the emotional toll, because right, it's just not natural. Our parents take care of us. And when you have to take care of your parent and you see them in that state, it's like you said, it's almost too much to handle. You, No one prepared you to do that. 
there's not a class you go to. There's not, people today are much more likely to talk about their parenting fails, but no one really talks about their taking care of their parent fails. No one posts about that on Facebook. No one shares that status. No, it's, and, and it's hard. And, you know, I, I feel for, so I know other people who are doing the similar things that we are, um, taking care of a parent. I'm thinking, I never realized how hard it was. Mm -mm. And, you know, it's um, in some ways, you know, arguing with dad about taking a shower. It's like arguing with another four-year-old that I know. Hey, <laughs> can you get in? You need to go take a bath. This is and, why. And I'm fighting the same battle. <laughs> so I, I'm learning again. Um, grace and mercy is one of those things that you need to give people as much as possible. Amen. I think that, thank you for sharing that. I was not expecting you to, to go from professional to personal in that way, but that transition was really quite beautiful. And I think that both subjects that we talked about are incredibly common and under, under conversationalized, um, especially, I wish we spoke more about the, about the parent thing, because it's just, it's an emotional toll and I'm not at, at a position because I haven't personally experienced it myself, but no one's prepared for it. And what you experienced probably was a long time coming. Yeah, it probably had a lot to do with work, but I imagine living with your dad has brought its own struggles because he's been there a while, hasn't he? He has. It's been, it's, he's been with us um, about 18 months and it's it does change your lifestyle and how you live and, and all those things. And, and I love my dad and I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, you know, it's, it's different. I'm probably different in that I was an adopted child. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, um, I, I tend to cling to things that are family because it's that stability for me. I think some, you know, like a, a lot of times adopted children, I, I seem to think have, they're worried about abandonment or not being wanted. And so for me, you know, I always knew that my parents loved me and wanted me, so it was always encouraging. And so that's, um, I just, I've, I've really taken, enjoyed taking care of dad and even on the bad days, but that day in particular, just completely went sideways every which way. It was crazy. And I have, just can't, don't get to forget it. What advice would you give to someone who is taking care of an ill parent? Um, find options for respite care when you can. Um, and know where your limitations are. When, when, when to say when. Um, we're kind of there. Get, we're beginning to see that with that, or he's getting to a point where there's some things that we just can't help him with, like we need to. And so we're trying to figure out what those next steps are, and that's not easy. How does this affect your marriage and how, what are some advice you can give to people? Certainly it's harder for your wife because that's not, that's not her dad. It's her family, but it's not her dad. She has been very graceful and gracious and loving and, you know, caring and helping me and, and, and all those things. And so she is, she's been a good daughter um, to him. And it's, it's tough, I think, learning that I still need to date my wife. I mean, I, I would tell anybody this. Right? That's we seem tend to focus on our children sometimes to the um, detriment of everything else. But you don't want to wind up with your kids graduating high school and you look at your spouse and say, "Who are you? And what are we doing?" So Don and I still date. We go out on dates. Yes, I can go to Walmart with her and make it a date. Um, I don't know if I agree with that. Well, yep. uh, you can have fun yeah, until you see me put the flower pot on my head and sing Whip It from Devo. I mean, you know, come on, it's flashback to the 80s. But um, we date, I spend time with her, we talk. I don't like to be away from her. I like to be around her. She likes to be around me and she's my best friend. And so that friendship deepens and enriches and we watch each other walk through challenges and you, you learn to lean on one another. So your advice to someone going through this with a spouse or a partner in their home would be to communicate more, to find more time to be alone. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. That For us, that's hard. It's very and hard. We try to work it out. Um, but 
but we, I would encourage anybody, you got to find that time, make that time. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're not taking care of an ill parent, but we have two very young children. And one thing that I finally convinced AJ to do is to journal with me. And I think that this is a good way to just, I've always been a writer. I talked about this in my episode with AJ. When I fail, I have to write it down in order to properly process it. And when our marriage is struggling, or when I'm not feeling fulfilled, or AJ is not feeling fulfilled, and I can't, because my husband's not the best communicator. I think most men, not maybe not most men, I can't say that, but a lot of men I think struggle with communication. We, we, yeah, we're um, probably not good at that. No, no, I don't think it comes naturally to y'all. I'm real good at verbalizing what I need, but if AJ can't tell me what he needs, but I feel that he needs something, but I don't know what it is, I have to write it down. So I think that for us, maybe not so much dates because, I mean, my husband's an incredibly antisocial individual, picky eater. So like there's, there's only so many times we can go get hibachi, right? Like a date for me would be sitting down and journaling for 30 minutes and talking about our journal entry. I think, it, again, someone who's coming from the perspective of having young children and just wanting to connect with my spouse, that's something more than surface level. I imagine that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Finding something that's deeper than two feet. Yeah, you got to, and sometimes it's, you start talking about your day or something you've seen and you realize this conversation went in a completely different direction and how do we wind up here? But this has been fun. And, and I think learning to, laugh I think laughter is is a great medicine I think it lowers stress and just being able to laugh with each other and just laugh at stupid stuff like walking into the door or you know your hair looking goofy when you get up in the morning that kind of thing and just being able to laugh at each other and with each other and bring some levity because when you're dealing with um, aging parents you know that there is an end point that gets really rough. Mm -hmm. And so take time to laugh. I agree. But you got to find things that make you both laugh. AJ and I were still figuring, AJ just has terrible taste in movies. I, we, we need to find something that we both have in common when it comes to comedy. We're struggling with that one, maybe a comedy show or something. But I think that you connected both topics really, really well. Again, was totally not expecting you to talk about grandpa, but I'm glad you did because from an outsider looking in, it just seems like if you are not prepared, bringing in a parent, especially a parent with Alzheimer's, could just destroy your marriage. If it's if you don't communicate well, if you don't talk about the struggles, because remember your your wife is going to see someone that she at one point had to have very high esteem respect for, act like a four year old, poop themselves, like that's a whole new level. That needs you need to talk about that stuff, right? And then add work stress in there. Add add in a, a major failure at work. I mean, it's a it's a perfect storm for disaster. So I think it just goes to the old saying you don't prepare for a hurricane when it's already raining. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming on and talking to us about a massive career failure. I mean, 20, luckily there was a solution for that though, but that is an amazing lesson, hopefully to many people entering this industry and also talking about such a sensitive topic as your dad. I appreciate you coming on. Well, I've enjoyed it. Everyone that, go ahead. <laughs> see you guys again soon. I know, I'll see you. I'll probably see you this weekend, actually. I haven't seen Natalie in so long. How was Halloween, by the way? Oh man, it was It was great. It was actually, I mean, it was wonderful. It was cool. It was cold yeah. out, right? Yeah, two years ago, it was like the blast furnace from hell was here in Jacksonville. It was like 100 degrees, the kids wouldn't wear their costumes. And so we basically, they went trick-or-treating naked. Um, I think I was there that year. It rained, because we, we kept artists. 
Yes, yeah. I remember because it was too hot. Yeah, and it was rainy, so we had that. So then um, this year was perfect weather. The kids were out, the adults were out. I think people so desperately wanted to get out and just mingle and be normal. Oh, I bet your neighborhood was so fun. It was a scream. It was a scream. And yes, I did did teach the grandchildren about taxation and how that. Oh, you took their candy. I took. Yes, I did. I will scarf up some candy from that. They don't need Reese's cups. Of course not. No one needs those. I I have a cabinet full of white Hersh, the cookies and cream Hershey's. <sighs> Kenny doesn't need those. It's a devil's candy. <laughs> But all right, thank you for coming on the show, everyone. This has been another episode of Failure Friday. Thank you for joining us. Again, if you would like to join us for an episode of this, uh, you can hit me up at my DMs. You can send me a message on Facebook or you can text me if you have my phone number and I will send you a calendar link for scheduling. We are scheduled into about the middle of next year, but you are welcome to come on. Send me constructive criticism. I wanna make this as educational and beneficial to everyone as possible. I really enjoy talking to these people. Again, they are close people in my life, friends, clients. Uh, Ted happens to be all of those things. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a good night.